Hi everyone and welcome back to Nisora channel. Today we are talking about a controversial topic. Are books becoming obsolete in the age of AI, chat GPT and the vast amount of digital information available on the internet? With technology advancing rapidly, let's see if the traditional textbooks can stand up against modern digital resources. Let's get into it. So, uh, are textbooks dead? It's a controversial topic, and it's a topic that's uh, also very germane to my area of expertise, as I have been publishing textbooks for nearly two decades, so I have a lot to say about this. Let's do a little test here. So, you want to fix the light in your fridge. It does not work. And of course, you've got to figure out how to do it, and there's a number of different ways you can do it. Uh, you can get a book, do it yourself, one of these uh, home maintenance with dummies. You can search the internet how to fix the fridge. You can ask the Chuck GPT how to do it. You can watch a YouTube video, and there may be other sources. So let's take a little poll. Who would here go to buy a book to fix the fridge? Anybody raise your hand? <laughs> Not too many. I guess I can stop my talk right here and say the books are dead. <laughs> okay, who would search internet to find information? Okay, so I think most people would. Would anybody reach out to chat GPT? Okay, so um, a, few, a few people would. Would anybody look for a YouTube uh, video on how to? Look at that. So most people will look for a YouTube video. And there you have it. Do you have any other sources you will go for, Tilo? Yeah, buy a new fridge. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Tasmanian system. Do not <laughs> That's great, Tilo. Uh, uh, yes, but uh, as you can see, I don't. You know, you guys certainly remember uh, this for dummies book series. This was one of the biggest hits in the universe. Everybody had at least like a twenty of these books. Uh, for dummies how to play guitar, for dummies how to make clout, for dummies how to be happy, and on and on and on. But let's now move on to your medical practice. So you have a challenging case, and you're kind of rusty on what's going on. The patient is ASAF4, has got a lot of different things and medications. What are you going to reach for? So who would look into Miller's textbook, or a large textbook of anesthesiology, to figure out what to do? Would anybody reach? There's a few people who would. Uh, would anybody go on the internet to check out what's going on? Okay. Uh, would anybody ask Chad GPT? Okay. Also a few people now. Would anybody go to YouTube to figure out how do I, what the hell do I do? You see, not yet. But I think that will change. Okay, but we got any information. Uh, basically, textbooks are uh, nearly dead. Uh, they exist, they're out there, you study for, from them for your exams perhaps, or what have you. But when it comes to clinical use and a daily practice, you know, based on the poll that we've done here, nobody seems to be really eager to reach out into a thick textbook to find out information. And in fact, when we asked our community on YouTube, what do they do to study anesthesiology or prepare for anesthesia exams? And even for studying, 75% of people said they do not use textbooks often or at all. There's only 25% people who actually use regularly textbooks. Now, this poll was conducted across the world, so there could be geographical differences. As an example, in areas of the world where the internet may not be so readily available or where the uh, you know, authority still lies on old school textbooks, perhaps that's where that comes from, but I don't really know. Um, I have published a number of textbooks over my professional career. At the same time, I want to tell you an anecdote. This is an Isora YouTube channel. It has 200,000 subscribers. About uh, a year ago, I was in Tampa, Florida for an Isora's workshop uh, with my family. We did not teach. Uh, we had our instructors there for a workshop that had about 50, 60 people or so. And we just wanted to say hi to everyone. And as I walked into the room, Half of the audience jumped and said, that's the YouTube guy. <laughs> and suddenly it occurred to me that the social media presence, me as a YouTuber, actually was a lot more significant for recognition than whatever else I had done in my life, including the publication, the research, the books. None of that seemed to be all that relevant. But this all of a sudden became a lot more relevant. Then I'll get back to that. Now to publish a book, 
This is what the, uh, the book publishers actually, publishing houses do. They identify a potential author, then they solicit a book title, meaning they talk into Professor Christoph and they want Professor Christoph to produce a book and they ask him, would you be interested? And he says, yes. Then they take a book title from him, meaning orthopedic surgery for hip replacement. And then Professor Christoph now needs to develop a table of content and, and produces a chapter sample. So the publisher really wants to know or wanted to know if he knows what's going on in the field. And then they also wanted to know if he's capable of actually producing a chapter. But what's the point of you know, soliciting a potential author who will never produce anything? So that's like a crucial step <coughs> to overcome. The next thing is um, the publisher then sends that table of content and the chapter of the, of the book, sample, to a bunch of people in orthopedic field and they are asking them for, is this book relevant? Is this table of content relevant for today's medicine? And is the uh, content of that chapter sample uh, representative uh, for what the textbook should be like? And if that's the yes, then it goes to the next process, which it takes about two to three years process. Professor Christoph Corten is now assigned an editing manager who whenever he needs an illustration or something, he reaches out to and she he guides him through that process. And actually after three years or so, a book is published. Now in the old times, I'm talking 200, uh, 2010 when I published the first book, everybody, uh, the whole anesthesiology world, every single address, the nurse anesthetist, doctors, anesthesiologists, they all received a postcard. The new book, Admir Hatzik, peripheral nerve blocks, whatever. Then the publishers, they went to all of the medical meetings. They had a stand, they exhibited the books. Fast forward 20 years today, they don't do any of it. What they do, they take your information, they wrap it up in India or Indonesia or some place in the world, and they resell it to distributors. <laughs> and they turn to you and they say, Professor Carlton, what are you doing to promote your book? That's really where the world is today. So that's what the process really was. Today, um, it doesn't really work like that. The publishers actually do not even have enough handling editors. They send a mass email with a solicitation for you to publish your own book. So you get an email and says, uh, why you should publish your book with us? This is Springer, is a very reputable publisher. The textbook today has substantial erosion. The field authority is no longer necessary. It's not necessary for you to publish, you know, 100 papers, uh, have a PhD, uh, be a professor at the university like Professor Corton. All you need to do is, you need to be a dude who wants to publish a book. And why would you publish a book? Well, it looks good on your table. You know, the guests come in and your book, your book author, your patients, you may get more promotion, more patients if your book uh, author. These are the reasons. So the erosion of the textbook value today is immense. Today anyone can publish a book. Authority in the field is no requirement. Uh, you are being or will be solicited actively to actually publish a book on your own. Modus operandi, all they want to do is publish as many books as possible at your cost, not their cost. The time has come also that they ask you we would accelerate this process and distribute your book for 20K. But if you become a book author, it's the same as an open access publishing today. And so online publishing also, and book publishing as well, even though everybody goes to the textbooks, you should know that the textbook is not really a peer-reviewed material. In other words, the author of the textbook writes whatever he or she wants. And <laughs> that is what the textbook. Uh, is. Now, of course, it's supposed to be evidence-based, whatever, but it's really not checked. Miller's textbook of anesthesiology, this is for uh, those of you that may be closer to my age or uh, career, whatever, we all grew up on this. Everybody had every new edition of this, and if you didn't have it, then you were not interested in your specialty. How many of you have bought the latest edition of Miller's anesthesia textbook? Nobody. Nobody, okay? And this is the, the main textbook in the field. It has 3,115 pages with the biggest authors in anesthesiology, authorities on individual fields. But the last edition was published in 2019. 
In the meantime, there's been exposure of evidence, information that's not in the book. So the books cannot really keep up like that uh, with, the, with the advancement of the information. So the traditional textbooks, I think, have no future. Few medical professionals read large textbooks, even in a digital format. The content in collaboration for writing textbooks takes a long time. By the time you're done with the textbook, it's already obsolete. Uh, it, they're very expensive. It takes, you know, it's really expensive to publish a book. <clears throat> the visuals in books are lacking because new generations of students of medicine, they are used to visuals. They want visuals, they want infographics, they want to summarize information in a rapid, frenzy world that we live of digital communication and digital information. Nobody has time to dig into large textbooks and, and digest them. So the trend towards skinny, condensed, summarized, and immediately implementable knowledge, that's the trend, not the lengthy chapters. Uh, to that matter, who reads medical journals today? We had a little bit of that information yesterday. Very few people do. The medical journals back in the day, you came to work. There will be a stock of them in your office. There will be a stock of them in the kitchen. There will be some of them in the bathroom. Uh, so you had every little incentive to pick up one of those journals and flip through a few pages and, and, and find something that's interesting that you can learn from while you're drinking coffee, eating lunch, or in between cases. Today, who has journals in their offices? Nobody has. It's gone. So what we're dealing with also today is an information overload. This is a substantial problem. There's too much information, and that is categorized as an overwhelming amount of information such that one struggles to find what you need at any, any moment. And that's really uh, true. There's a rapid knowledge expansion, so many publications, open access journals, there's a new pharmaceutical, uh, you know, and devices, and, and the specialties are evolving. But how do you access the quality and, and, um, and good information? That really is becoming ever larger challenge. Internet information, can you trust AI? And can you trust information on the, on the internet? How can you sure, be sure that what you read in social media, such as on Instagram, LinkedIn, and you know in the, in the era past, you knew people based on what they published in the literature. Today, what you know about people is what they feature in the social media. That information is all, um, like Trump would say, you know, it's, you say whatever you want to, there's no consequences and there's no peer review. There's nobody to, who examines that information. You just feature whatever you want. So how do you find the correct information? Look at the online information in the medical literature explosion. It's really difficult to keep up with this. How do you actually uh, decipher what is important, what is not, what is credible? What is not? It's really not easy. So there's definitely a, a need for a unified platform that combine the content, and journals should unite in that quest. Unfortunately, the journals all compete with each other for eyeballs, for subscribers, and they do not share that. So how does the AI or artificial intelligence fits in there? Well, there's no question, I think, that the healthcare systems are complex and changing for everybody. But the AI can be used to diagnose diseases, develop personal treatment plans, it can assist you with decision making as well. It's gotten so good that if you ask GPT about what to do with somebody who has hyper, high hypertension before induction of anesthesia, uh, it will give you a protocol what to do. However, uh, there's really all substantial challenges that relate to the data privacy, Bias. Some of this may be driven by industry. Basically, the chat GPT, they go through all the information accessible to them, including uh, the pharma reports that promote their own drugs. And you do need a human expertise. So chat GPT and, and, and the artificial intelligence, as of yet, cannot really replace the human decision making. However, it has advanced so much that it definitely can be used to help you get some preliminary information. And I can tell you, if you are going to visit your primary physician, you're much better off by doing your own search on AI and summarizing it and bringing it to your physician, than having the physician figure out 
you know, uh, what's going on with you. It's unfortunate, but that's the case. I will just summarize, and that is, there's substantial challenges of information age and information overload that, we, that we're facing. Changing role of the traditional textbooks, you can't deny it, nobody reads them anymore. So the traditional textbooks, they're dead, they're, they're obsolete. And there's a substantial challenge of determining actually what credibility uh, of that information is that you read on, on Altasan. And with that, I want to thank you, and we can take up some questions later during the uh, questions and answers period. Thank you. <laughs> So are books obsolete in this digital age? While AI and the internet offer incredible convenience and access to information, books still hold some value as long as they are timely updated, which can be challenging in traditional publishing model. However, when timely updated, they can provide authoritative information, depth, context, and a tangible experience that digital media cannot fully replicate. Thanks for joining me on this exploration. And if you enjoyed this discussion, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more thought-provoking content. And leave your thoughts in the comments below. Do you think that the books are here to stay? See you in the next video.